Hello, gentles and ladymen. I'm Ulan Gaming, and I came to a shocking and horrifying discovery recently. Every single one of my India videos has flopped, and nobody fucking plays this sieve. <laughs> Uh, which is a capital crime, punishable by death in my opinion, because Bollywood has shown us that India is fucking awesome. A lot of times, when I see people not wanting to play India, I hear things like lack of upgradeability or bad late game economy, and what I hear more than anything is settlers cost wood, therefore they bad. And it never even crosses their mind that Dutch settlers cost coin, but nobody cares because Dutch have tons of extra coin gathering perks to make up for that, and India is exactly the same. Obviously, India is designed around and completely based with to make the idea that their settlers cost would work. And like Dutch, it just means their eco is a little weird. And that is not something that should phase you. Anyway, pretty much all that is wrong, and it pisses me off. So I'm making uh, of this video. I, I'm, I'm responding to the knowledge that my India videos get no views by doubling down and making another India video. This will be a close, in-depth look at India, similar to the Civ overview I made, but way more in-depth, instead of just being a 10-minute teaser for the Civ. Like, look how long this video is. I don't know how long it's gonna be yet. I'm still writing the script. Welcome to the modern India, India comprehensive guide, Ulan Gaming Style, with all of my biases and personal opinions shoved in your face and declared to be fact. Let's jam. I suppose we'll start with the Civ's unique bonuses, and slowly start to bleed into everything else. So, India's big thing is that settlers cost wood instead of food. You know, people often say money doesn't grow on trees, or steak doesn't grow on trees, or apples don't grow on trees, and those are all true statements, but in India, people actually just hey. casually grow on trees. This is canon and easily observable in India itself if you ask anyone who's been there. It's just a thing. When couples want a kid, they plant a tree in their backyard. This is represented in-game. If you chop down a 300-wood tree and take it to your town center, trained orchard owners will harvest up three new fully-grown adults from it for you to use to further your civilization. This is also canon in real India. Children are obviously born from saplings. It's just that all the trees in Age of Empires are fully grown. For balance purposes, you see. In any other civilization, this would be terrible. Uh, but just like Dutch and coin, India has lots of bonuses to help them uh, boost their economy and, and work with this. The other sub bonus, for example, is that instead of settler shipments, they get a free settler with every shipment they send, except for infinite ones. This means that over the course of the game, when other civs may send three or three and five for a total of eight settlers, by the game ends for you, you will have read five, received five 15, all the way up to 25 total settlers from shipments without ever having to explicitly send a settler shipment. In particular, this added value is nice in Age 1 with the Distributivism shipment, which is normally okay for everyone else and decent for Russia, but amazing for India, because it's one settler plus 1.25 wood per second it is better than a 3 vil shipment. It's actually more like 3.5 vils plus an infinite source of wood. Uh, even better, they have another and even stronger wood trickle in Age 2 called Foreign Logging, which provides a trickle of 2.35 wood per second, in addition, of course, to providing a settler. These two shipments together are so strong, they are often the first two cards India will send, just back to back. Uh, because having both of these gives you a trickle fast enough to provide constant settler production by itself without needing anybody on wood meaning all you need is like four to five people on wood for a building every once in a while, and you can focus your entire economy on making military until age three, when you need to make more town centers. It's really freeing, actually. They also start with the ages one and two wood gather market techs already researched, so that's cool. The last civ bonus for India is that instead of harvesting cattle and livestock for food, they can't harvest them at all, but instead get XP for each piece of livestock they have. Uh, they get an XP trickle. Thanks to India's villager bonus, this means that the amount of livestock you have uh, directly impacts settler production from shipments. 
if the map has livestock, as an India player, you should heavily prioritize collecting them over treasures. On paper, uh, when you look at the UI, it doesn't look like each cattle provides much XP, XP, but let me tell you, it does make a difference, and it is noticeable. Especially when you get a lot of them on maps like Mongolia. To further boost this, India also has a building called the Sacred Field, which enables livestock to gather XP from it, and it can be boosted by both techs and cards. Although you can only train 20 cows, it's su in super long-lasting games, if you want more XP generation, you can always send your ally like a thousand food and ask him to make 10 cows with it and send it your way. I love the logic of India. Sir, we just got word that our Indian settlement has 20 cows. Oh my god, send them more sepoy! The cattle cannot fall into enemy hands, whatever the cost! Okay, now that we've gone over all the Civ bonuses, let's talk about Wonders. Simply put, India is awesome because there are four Wonders that are absolutely fantastic and one Wonder that is absolute trash and very obviously worse than the others, and it will always be incredibly easy to pick your Wonders as you age up through every age. Let's start with the Tower of Victory. This thing is a penis. And much like a penis, when you whip it up out of nowhere to intimidate or impress the stranger across from you, it doesn't really accomplish much and may result in you getting shot. That is to say that this wonder is one that sucks and that you'll never need to make. The wonder has an activated button that provides a 10% scaling HP and attack boost to all your units for 10 seconds. Sounds really good, right? Wrong. Why would I want that when the cooldown is like a fucking hour and the Mansabdars at Chelmanar Gate that we'll talk about later do the exact same thing but last much longer than 10 seconds and don't need to rest to get it back up again? Man, Tower Victory really is like a penis. Having said all that, Wonders always ship supplies or units when they are complete, so maybe the Tower of Victory can be useful in that regard. Realistically, considering the other Wonders, if you were to age with this, it would be either to ages 4 or 5. The TOV uh, ships wood, and quite a bit of wood, mind you. I think it ships like 1,500 in either ages 4 or 5. But with any other civilization, this would be a fantastic age-up bonus that they would probably pick every match in end every scenario. But this is India. What the fuck does India need with a massive late game wood shipment? This is like if you were to send 1,600 coin in age 4 as Dutch or send a canister of my sperm to your mom. All those are all, although those are all precious resources, they've already collected so much on their own that they are overflowing and are probably sending some to their allies and friends already. Next, we'll talk about the legendary Agrifort, one of the most infamous and well-known wonders in the game, uh, and pretty much seen and built in every India game in either ages 2 or 3. The Agrifort is a fort, obviously, which makes India one of the only civilizations in the game capable of having an H2 fort. Except that calling it a fort is a bit of a stretch. It has only a little over half the base HP as one, and less raw attack than an outpost, with the caveat that it does siege damage and some area of effects making it slightly better. Uh, even then, its HP is only exactly twice that of a barracks, making it rather flimsy. Now, it's a huge fucking building and provides both a shipment point and a training point, which is really intimidating. Uh, but if your opponent has even, like, ten pikemen, they can siege it down over time as long as they're protected. It's basically a glorified blockhouse. A really good one, mind you, uh, but a glorified blockhouse. If the Aztec fort is Homelander and a single strelet is a pea shooter from Plants vs. Zombies, the Agrifort is Denji from Chainsaw Man when he's kicking Aki in the balls. Shut up, this is a totally accurate scaling metrics. But fear not, friends, for once you get to age 3, you can give it an upgrade that boosts it from 5,000 hit points all the way to... still 5,000. Yeah, it only boosts attack and allows it to train cavalry units too. You don't get an HP bonus until the 4th age when you get all the way to 7,500 hit points, still less than a base level fort with far less attack. So yeah, compared to every other fort, this thing hits as hard as wet tissue paper and is flimsier than flat earth theory, but it's still one of the best age 2 winners in the game for its power in the first 10 minutes of gameplay. The Agra shipment is a, the Agra shipment is a unit shipment. In age 2 it provides 2 sepoy, and in age 3 it provides 5 Gurkha. 
We'll go over those units in particular later, but the rest of the ages don't really matter because ages 2 or 3 are where you're going to build the fort. So there you go. One of the most solid and powerful age 2 military-based wonders in the game. The Taj Mahal is up next and is a pretty unique wonder. It has an incredibly cool effect of being able to call a ceasefire. Uh, this prevents all players on the map from shooting each other for 10 seconds. Importantly, it doesn't stop buildings from shooting enemies, so I like to imagine that when the ceasefire happens, IRL, both armies just race to build up tents in the middle of the battlefield so they can count as being indoors, they can keep shooting each other. Whatever it takes to not technically commit war crimes, right? Well, well, the ability itself is neat. It's not something to actively base a build around. More of a, a, a cool ability to pull out whenever you see the need to save some units in trouble. Like when your Gurkamas gets caught out by Hus while your Sepoy are far away and need to reposition. The ability can be a serious lifesaver. You just need to know when and how to use it. What's nice about the Taj Mahal, uh, is that it, that makes it a nice wonder to age up with in a build order, is that it sends a coin shipment. This helps out with fast industrial strategies with an 800 coin shipment into age 3, or can help you afford some big hefty howdahs once you get to age 3. All in all, it's a good middle ground wonder that can't, that can't really make its own build order, but can assist in other build orders or get the resources for a solid Fortress Age unit mass. Next up, the Carni Mata. This is tied with Agrifort as the best wonder overall and is the only other wonder, wonder that you should consider making in Age 2. As of the anniversary update in October when it was buffed, the Carni Mata boosts, uh, boosts all settler resources within 44 range of it by 15%, making it India's economic boosting wonder, the wonder equivalent of the Toshigu Shrine for Japan or the Porcelain Tower for China. It provides an excellent mixed resource shipment for constructing it, giving you a little of all three resources. Going to going into age two with it, I believe you get 200 wood, 200 food, and 100 corn. Well, coin. Corn. Uh, which is insane. Like, fuck virgin quartermaster over there. Let me have that carny mata, which ages 10 seconds faster with four settlers, provides more resources and boosts gathering. Like, fuck. I recently put out a poll asking people if they played India, and one guy commented that he took one look at the late game gather rates and determined it wasn't a viable endgame. But he kind of missed the point and the overall trend of India that they have so much upgradeability built into their civilization at a base level that without cards, uh, at a base level without cards, that their lack of upgrade cards isn't a hindrance. And he's also just wrong. Like, look at this rice paddy gather rate. The important thing about rice paddies and native farms like African field and African fields is that unlike farms and estates, your settlers don't wander or walk around where they work. This is a little known fact, but for European civs, when settlers are walking around the farm and estate, they aren't actually collecting resources. Somebody way better at math than me did some tests and found that this actually makes a huge difference in resources, and that it really makes Portugal's amazing farms really not so amazing in comparison to the Asian and native civs, especially Aztec. Uh, the ga this gather rate here puts India at a very similar level to Aztec and doesn't require even half the cards, and that's amazing. Uh, this wonder is useful for a more economic focus stage too, instead of a rush, or for a fast fortress. There really isn't much else to say about it. It's fantastic. All right. Last but certainly not least is the Chelminar Gate, the wonder that completely invalidates the Tower of Victory unless you've already made the Chelminar Gate. This is a military-based wonder and provides a military unit shipment, like its cousin, the Agrifort. However, instead of masses of infantry, uh, the gate provides small shipments of India's big heavy units, the most notable in my opinion, opinion being a shipment of two Mahouts going into age 4, which is, in my opinion, the best time to make this wonder. As for what it does, this gate is a training building that allows you to make Mansabdars, special versions of other units such as a Mansabdar Sepoy or a Mansabdar Gurkha. They have twice the population cost and resource costs, and twice the HP of, 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 as their normal unit counterparts, and you can only have one of each of them. The reason you want them, however, is because they provide an aura to units around them for 10% scaling HP and attack, making them kind of like a captain or a team leader. Just like how a solid team leader that knows what they're doing can make everything in the workplace go smoother and faster. However, the aura doesn't work with other units, so a man of Dar's Sepoy won't be able to give its stat bonus to a giant to the giant mass of Mahouts sitting next to him. Just like how if you were to take a drill sergeant from the military and have him use the same skill set and methods to take charge of a bunch of three-year-old girls having a tea party at their stuffed animals, it probably wouldn't go very well. Where in hell are you from anyway, Private? 
Sir, Texas, sir! Holy dog shit! Texas, only steers and queers come from Texas, private cowboy! And you don't much look like a steer to me, so that kind of narrows it down. But this invalidates the Tower of Victory, because it provides the exact same stat boost, but applies it permanently on the troop of units until the Mansadar dies, and can just be quickly retrained. You don't last only 10 seconds, and then have to take a massive break. The lesson we can learn from this is that strong, confident leadership qualities are better for attracting women than unsolicited dick pics. Now, the scaling component of the 10% buff is important because it means that the buff is applied to the unit's current stats instead of their base stats, so the more upgrades they have, the more they get out of the aura boost. This makes Chalminar Gate better in the Industrial and Imperial Ages than it does in the early game. A lot of people point out that India doesn't have much in the way of unit upgrade cards, which is true to a degree, except for one class of units, they don't really have much in the way of upgrades. However, all that completely ignores the existence of the Chalminar Gate, which provides often more than combat cards can give without ever having to send a card at all. It also ignores how amazing certain India units are at a base level, but we'll get that to the, we'll get to that later. The point is the gate is incredible, incredible, and you should use it. Okay, wonders are done. Next, let's look at the military, and we'll start with the most important in India military unit, which is of course their explorer. Bear with me here. Anyone who's seen my channel before knows I'm a total explorer nerd, and this is gonna take a bit. Uh, those of you who watch my hero tier list video know that I ranked the India Brahmin monk very highly in the A tier just below the S, and some people in the comments were confused, or just flat out disagreed with me. Well, here I am to say I completely, fully stand by what I said before, and that naturally, just like any other opinion I have, anyone who disagrees with me is completely wrong. I'll now explain why this is so, and anyone who disagrees can feel free to contact the Buckshot is Always Right Foundation, or BARF for short, and get promptly ignored. The India Explorers are fucking awesome. The India riding t pose legends that serve as India's Explorers are admittedly a very weird explorer. Like all Asian monks, they lack a crack shot and instead have a stun ability that lets them make a target not move for a while so they can safely beat up their friends. However, whereas other native explorers also have a crit ability that provides them a percent chance to do double damage, and overall high attack rates making for good DPS, India's explorers have a percent chance to use their stomp ability, which does some bonus damage, and stuns them for about a half a second, stopping any attack the animation they were in and giving the monks another free hit. While this ability on paper is technically better than criticals, Indian elephants also have less hand attack than any other explorer, with a base attack of 4 instead of 6 or even 7 like some explorers have. This makes it so that even though they have fantastic stun capabilities and can swing without consequence a lot, they have very low DPS and often take much longer to kill single individual treasure guardians than other explorers. Additionally, being split into two means that when one dies, their overall DPS is halved, which results in them losing pretty much every explorer battle in the game. Uh, they also can't snare enemy explorers, even if they're fighting. Uh, e e e so even if they're winning, uh, it, it makes a, an explorer kill with India almost impossible, as they can just kind of run away. Uh, and then despite them not being able to snare, they're still snareable themselves, which kind of sucks. <laughs> So, all this is to say, why do I think that they're so good? There's several reasons, but first let's talk about their treasure-taking capabilities. Despite what I said earlier, they are amazing at taking treasures, and at base level can take bigger potential treasures than pretty much any explorer. But how can this be when they have low DPS and HP? It obviously comes down to micro and using their area of effects. Even though they have a low base damage, Indian monks are the only explorers in the game to have an area of effect on their attack at base level, and clever India players will clump enemies together before stunning them, massively increasing the amount of damage they can spill out over a large area. Uh, even though Indian elephants suffer when taking treasures for, with big heavy guardians that other civilizations can stun or just one-shot, uh, they can quickly and easily deal with treasures that have hordes of ma and massive amounts of guardians and clear them pretty much instantly without having to do complicated treasure creeps. As such, they can take very large treasures very early on in the game, and take different types of treasures that no one else can take without having extra units or taking forever to micro, giving them their own little treasure demographic all to themselves. 
Next thing that's awesome about them is that much like the Mexican Padre, they're healers. India just casually gets two unkillable healers so that you almost never have to bother with trying to get them in any other way. Though that often doesn't stop me from getting the British surgeons too. The fact that they can heal each other allows your explorers to very quickly recuperate from treasures and move right on to the next big treasure, allowing them to get more treasures and bigger treasures earlier than anyone else. They also have a ton of texts of the monastery and cards at the home city, giving them even more utility. Specifically, uh, they have one of the best explorer combat cards in the game, giving them a 60% boost instead of the usual 50, and allowing them to train tigers, which can help both obliterate treasures and serve as mini populationless hussars that you train to go that you can train on the go anywhere on the map, turning your explorers into stables with five movement speed. At the monastery, they can get another upgrade, which gives them white tigers as well, which are borderline identical in stats, and allowing your explorers to train up to 22 total units at any given time, even in your opponent's base. Due to getting a settler with the shipment, it's fine to even send the tiger card as your first shipment instead of distributivism if you really want to lean into that aspect of, the India, of India like my tiger rush in the previous video does. Link in the description. Other notable monastery upgrades include a buff to their healing, a fantastic 20% hand attack boost to them and all other elephants in addition to raising their stomp chance, and an equally fantastic tep giving them an aura that increases elephant movement speed around them, effectively turning your explorers into the Lakota war chiefs, but for giant tanks instead of horses. They're one of the most diverse explorers in the game, and one of the best at taking treasures at a base level. And all they suffer in exchange is losing to every other explorer in the game in a 1v1. Worth. Okay, after that much too long rant about explorers, let's get into the actual military, starting with the Gurkha. Gurkha take the role of skirmisher and are yeah, pretty good. They don't have any upgrade cards, really, except for like one that's not super good. And they have to get counter infantry rifling by sending a card, which kind of sucks. But they make up for this by having ever so slightly higher bases than a normal skirmisher and being in available in Age 2. For their utility alone, they are fantastic units, but most people either love or hate these guys. Some call them OP because of their early availability, and some kind of them call them kind of mad because of their lack of upgradability. The reality is somewhere in between. They're always useful and will always be good at their job, they just are obviously outclassed by tons of other skirmishers as the game starts to hit the 9 minute mark and everybody who fast fortressed is starting to stabilize. But they do their job and their extra bases help them out a lot. Serviceable middle will pack skirmisher. Good unit. Now let's talk about something that's much better, and that's the Seapoy. Many people are under the impression that the Sepoy falls off in the late game due to a lack of upgradability. The Sepoy and Gurkha together are the two most common units people point to when talking about the lack of upgrades in, at India's disposal. But this makes many people mistakenly come to the conclusion that this, that the, that this makes the Sepoy fall off into the late game, and they are wrong. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Look at these bases! That's sexy as fuck! Seapoy have 15% damage and 20% more HP than a normal musketeer. Like if someone were, it's like if someone were to give them a really good H3 combat card. But the fact that they are the unit's bases is extremely important because it means that veterancy and other upgrades hit the Seapoy harder than other musketeers, allowing them to keep up with the competition even without any cards. And once you get the Chalmanar Gate, there's just nowhere the enemy hide that your Sepoy won't just Kool-Aid man walk into without any issue thanks to their super good bases. Let it be known that without any cards whatsoever, the Sepoy base stats carry them through the entirety of the game with no issues whatsoever. And even then, they just got a price reduction in Age 4 with the most recent update, so it's even better. Uh, Bleed, you always like to comment based... Uh, based in my video's comment section, but there has never been a single thing on my channel as literally based as the Sepoy. So please give my dude some love with a based Sepoy in the comment section. Uh, Rapujits exist. They're kind of supposed to be an India version of Rod Aleros, but unlike Rods are kind of ass at their job since they aren't at fast, don't, as fast, don't have the same resistances, and are expensive as hell. They do have a 30% attack up card in H2, though, so that's pretty cool. It's not enough, though, and this card is honestly more useful for the tons of other units that gain benefit from the 15% hand attack bonus it provides across the board. 
They do have a couple niche use how uses, however, and one is being the only unit other than rods that can easily and effectively counter and dispatch Eagle Runner Knights. But moving on, let's talk cavalry, because they're more interesting. India has four cavalry units at their stable. More units than I think any other civilization has in their stable. They have two heavy cav units and two dragoon units, with each one uh, with one of each being available in age two, and one of each being available in age three. Their age two units consist of the camel cav, sours and zambarax. Sours take lancer roll similar to the naginata, and zambarax take a dragoon roll. Okay, real talk, the, the sours are kinda ass. They are pathetically flimsy and easy to kill and do, like, no damage to anything other than the skirmishers that they directly counter. They have worse stats than Cossacks, but are still too population and more expensive. They're nifty and useful if you really need some Mage 2 Cav and can get the job done, albeit taking some losses, but really they just kind of suck. 20 base damage is not good, even with the 2 times against Light Infantry. Now, to their credit, India does have a card that boosts the multiplier of camel units, both the Sours and the Zams. However, the card also lowers their base attack in exchange, making them even more of a flimsy, hyper-specialized unit that can only do one thing, and it's just not good. Zams are better than their Sour counterparts. Being, available in, uh, being a Dragoon available in Age 2 makes India one of the only civs with access to a serviceable Skirm Goon combo in the Second Age. They are a one-pot Dragoon, which completes the trinity of Royer Zam Javelin Rider. However, they are by far the weakest of the three, sporting meh DPS at best, and by far the smallest HP bar of the three. It's rough to be a camel in this universe, I'll tell you that. This seriously sometimes feels like my camel units just come with explosives strapped to their chest that are triggered to explode and kill the rider the second an enemy shoots them even fucking once. Still, they are better than Sours because they at least are actually one pop for having the stats for it, and aren't the most expensive thing in the universe. So, you yeah, know, there you go. Okay, so I mentioned that there was an exception, and that one class of units was super upgradable, and I've saved these for last. Not only, uh, because not only is this class of units hilariously buffable, but it also takes up half of India's entire unit roster. And I am, of course, talking about elephant units, of which India has five. Uh, being explorers that we already talked about, flail elephants, siege elephants, mahouts, and howdas. Oh, howdas. We'll be talking about you soon, baby. Don't you worry. Just keep that sweet patootie shooting. <sighs> okay. Uh, so elephants are the most insane class of units you've ever seen, and despite their overall incredible bases, have more upgrades than Age of Empires Three has historical inaccuracies. <laughs> Between their 20% Age 3 combat card, the Monastery Tex, and other cards in Ages 2 and 4, uh, elephants, separ uh, elephants can get uh, plus 25% HP and 25% range attack, plus 60% hand attack, boosts to their damage resistances, two separate boosts to their movement speed, population cost reduction and price reduction. Uh, then they can get the Mansabdar on top of that, which scales with all the other stat boosts, and you can add the 7% hit points again from the British Consulate as well. And yes, you could technically mention the Tower of Victory, but that's not likely to happen very often. Uh, Indian Elephants have always had a good amount of upgrade ability, but the recent update with the Anniversary really pushed it to the next level. So just be aware that all of these upgrades uh, apply to all of the next four units that we're going to talk about. Okay, first I want to talk about my waifu, the Howda, And I'm going to take a little bit here, so I apologize. One of the biggest complaints I see about elephant units is that they aren't population efficient, despite their power. Uh, this can make them very solid for huge power spikes, but can make pure elephant compositions sometimes unreliable. The Howda completely breaks this trend and says, hold my beer. Howdas are not only population efficient, they are hyper population efficient, even more so than the fucking Soldado. And I have absolutely played many an India game just making Howdas as my primary unit, and it really just fucking works. Howdas cost 6 population and have 667 base HP and 60 attack. Uh, and take the Dragoon class of unit, being a ranged cavalry that counters other cavalry and artillery. It's important to know that all the numbers I'm using here are the base stats in Age 2, 
and that they come pre-upgraded to veteran in H3, exactly like the Dragoon. Uh, they have 20% range resistance, slightly slower movement speed than other Dragoons, and a much heftier 18 range, making them pretty much everything the War Wagon wishes it could be. To judge their population efficiency, you need to compare them to the global standard of the unit class, being the Dragoon. Dragoons have age 2 bases as well, and a base HP of 200 with 22 attack. They cost 2 population. Uh, using the Dragoon as a base, we can concur that for a Dragoon to be population efficient, it needs to have somewhere around 100 HP and 11 attack per population. Uh, this isn't perfectly accurate, and I'll tell you why later, but for now, let's just go with this. How does costing 6 population means that to be on track uh, to be a population efficient by this base level, calculation means that they need to be somewhere in the realm of 600 HP and 66 attack. Uh, which they completely and totally are, having the numbers swapped a little at 667 HP and 60 attack. They are almost perfectly and exactly three times a Dragoon, which is what they should be. However, there's more to it than that, and they are actually far, far above Dragoons in population efficiency. And to, play, and to explain that, we need to look at the Soldado. The Soldado is a Mexican Musketeer that costs two population instead of one, and has stats to match and back that up. It's in a similar position as the Howda. However, by our metric we used earlier, the Soldado would be population inefficient, because at twice the pop, although it does have twice the HP, it only has a little over one and a half times the attack. A normal Musketeer has 23 attack, and a Soldado has 36. By our metric, it would need to be at around 46 to be population efficient. And yet, Soldados are widely considered to be almost exactly as population efficient as normal Musketeers, and a single Soldado is an almost exact, perfect, and even matchup against two normal Musketeers. This is because of damage drop-off. Even if three Dragoons went to head-to-head -head against one Howda, and they had exactly the same total amounts of HP and damage, the Howda will always win the fight, because as soon as one Dragoon dies, the Dragoon side has less overall damage despite the total HP pool not changing. As a result, as population and e HP increases if, uh, evenly, in order to remain equally population efficient, you don't actually need anywhere near as much attack. This is why the Soldado has less than double the attack of a Musketeer, despite having double the population and HP. And it's the reason the Soldado is almost an exact matchup stat-wise with two Musketeers. But the Howda isn't like this. Its stats are extremely close to being three Dragoons, while having slightly more HP and less attack than a total of the three, but only slightly. This means that not only is the Howda pop efficient, it's super pop efficient, and has higher HP and attack than what a six population Dragoon unit scaled to be equivalent of Dragoon ought to have. This applies to their Siege as well, as they have a very solid Siege for being a Dragoon class. Not the craziest, but it's pretty good. And all of this calculation, and even more, it is even crazier mentioning the once you mention that they have a card that reduces their population down to five, which just makes these numbers even crazier, for lack of a better word. As for resource cost efficiency, the Dragoons cost 90 resources per population and Howda costs 110. Uh, but because they are better than Dragoons, this, this kind of makes them roughly equivalent in resource efficiency, considering the stat disparity. However, India has a 10% elephant cost reduction card that lowers this to 99 resources per population once again, making the Howda the king of efficiency for their stats and upgradability. Now, there is one factor we haven't discussed yet in all this, and that is overkill. Overkill is when you do way more damage to something needed to kill it, and as a result, waste a lot of shot damage that could have been spent somewhere else. This is what happens when you have an entire group of 30 musketeers shoot one unit, and it's why attack move is so good and important as a button. Generally, however, the higher the attack a unit has, the more prone they are to overkill, since the minimum amount of damage they conflict is so high. Uh, there's definitely a point to be made here about Howdos, but honestly, since they can three-shot veteran carded musketeers, and due to the overwhelming the, the overwhelming power of their population efficiency, I don't really think this is a huge concern. Just hit attack move and call it a day. 
One of the craziest things about Howdos is that due to their absolute tankiness and ranged fighting capabilities, it's actually extremely difficult to lose a Howda and have one die. You could monitor them in combat and see which ones are taking the most damage and easily just click and move them away individually thanks to their size. Uh, they can just heal, Then they can just heal up and throw them back in, which makes them extremely synergistic with the healer explorers, and this concept can be thrown into overdrive with the consulate surgeons in hospitals. Of course, never dying only boosts resource efficiency as well, making Howdas one of the most truly insane units in the entire game. The only problem is that they take up a lot of investment, but it's well fucking worth it, and they're like one of my favorite units. Okay, Mahouts and Flail Elephants all burn through quickly since I spent so long gushing about the Howdas. Mahouts are a Lancer-type elephant with a 7 population cost and 917 HP. They only have 28 attack, the same as a Naginata Rider, but they have a 2 times against heavy infantry instead of 1.5, and 2 area of effect to boost it, uh, which makes it very difficult to calculate how much damage they're actually worth and whether it's worth the 7 population. Uh, Mahouts are a good example of a unit not being quite as efficient in population, and something that people can rightly point out. Uh, but they provide a massive power boost when they arrive on the field, and are usually worth it regardless. It only takes one or two Mahouts to completely wipe a Skirmisher Mass of a decent size, and the extreme levels of hand attack upgrade, abil uh, upgrade availability uh, available to Elephants really make up for their somewhat lackluster bases. Uh, in a game I recently played, and I think I may have posted it on the channel at this point, um, I my, my, I just had a group of Mahouts that completely wipes a massive chunk of, like, 70 Forest Prowlers. It really is quite insane. Oh, look at this, look at this! Haha! We finally got a connect! Flail Elephants are the meme unit that people have been slowly figuring out recently aren't actually shit and can pull their weight. Uh, being somewhat niche, Flails are a melee building smasher just like the Howd Rams, except they can actually fight to a degree against normal units, and even have infantry multipliers making them a third fucking India unit that can be called Lancer-type cavalry. Uh, they shred buildings to pieces, and that's really all that's important to know about them. Uh, you can make goofy strats at them and totally make them work, and the Team 2 Flail Elephant is actually really solid. Uh, Age of Bison tournament casts from the previous 2v2 Sunbros tournament prove this. Give them a shot, they're better than you think. Okay, lastly, let's talk about Siege Elephants, and this is where my glorious praise comes to an end. Uh, this unit is the most overrated piece of trash in the game. I know, hot take, right? Uh, it's a culvern mortar combo unit with high HP and decent movement speed for a cannon unit, and it doesn't need to limber when unpacked in order to fire. On paper, this all sounds great and like a recipe for one of the greatest cannon units in the game. Unfortunately, it has several huge problems with it. One being its tags. This unit has both the Dragoon and Artillery tags, making it countered by... Everything in the entire fucking game. Skirmishers, they get a multiplier, and he all the the heavy in, the siege elephant also only has thirty percent range res. Heavy infantry, multiplier. Better hope that the Spanish player isn't making rattle arrows. Dragoons, multiplier. Hussars, no multiplier, but they already counter artillery. Culverns, oh, you better believe they have a multiplier, and even worse, they outrange the siege elephant by six. Fucking six. Siege Elephants only have 28 range, the, the same as a standard Falconet, and they don't do as much damage to other artillery as other, culverns, as other culverns do, despite being both more expensive and costing more population. The result is a highly mobile counter-artillery unit that loses in every culvern war it finds itself in, and can also get overwhelmed by mass artillery since they have the same range. Uh, it it has to get in range of every artillery unit it wants to kill before it can kill it, since almost every artillery unit in the game has at least 28 range. 
Siege elephants get the job done if the enemy just sent, like, a two Falk shipment or, so or something, but if the enemy is just trying to mass artillery and as much artillery as they can, siege elephants won't do the trick. In fact, India has a problem with countering artillery overall, since Sours and Zams are too flimsy and Mahouts are too slow and have bad pathing. India's best artillery counter is actually the Howda. Just gushing on that a little bit, the Howda's fucking shred cannons and into pieces, and you should really use them. Uh, the second best anti-artillery they have is actually just grabbing culverins from the Portugal consulate, believe it or not. Alright, alright, let's uh, quickly mention the consulate. India does not have a super in fact, impactful consulate like Japan and China does. They don't get banks, factories, or forts, they don't get resources trickle either. While this can be seen as a bad thing, I like to think of it that it makes India's consulate rather versatile, able to ship really whatever you need at any given time. Uh, the biggest standout is a tech of four settlers from the auto uh, from the auto consulate, but overall the strength of India's consulate is, is its versatility. There's no required text that you need; you can just immediately start getting whatever you want. You can ship great bombards, get extra batches of Minutemen, ships and fishing boats, resource crates, surgeons, and even spies and petards. This is, of course, not mentioning the solid unit roster you can just make with normal, it normally with export armies. In particular, the British consulate is a standout, providing an HP boost, and all the armies providing musketeers, hussars, and falconets. Okay, I'm quickly realizing that my script is nine fucking pages now, and I need to end this video. I'll probably upload the Howardus section separately as its own video, since I think it's in-depth enough to deserve it. Uh, this video is not going to give an India build order, but just gush about why I love the Civ so much, and see if I could convince any of you to give it a shot. I, don't, I didn't even get to talk about everything, like, you roomy swordsmen are insane, but maybe I'll just upload a video showing them off separately another day. India is an absolutely crazy civilization, with a lot of people not giving it the time of day because of its awkwardness to start with a wood-based economy or because of just flat-out incorrect things they have heard and assumed about the Civ and its units. Thank you for watching. If you got this far, please leave a comment, be it calling Sepoy-based or mentioning things I didn't have the time to mention, or leave a long essay telling me how wrong I am about everything. Either way, have a great day, gentles and ladymen, and goodbye. Kisses! Thank you, gentles and ladymen, for watching the video. Please do consider subscribing or leaving a like or a comment. It really helps the channel grow. Uh, so I can do more of this stuff. Thanks again. Have a good day.